Let's get back to the history of Ghana, and this is very important. Tomorrow is the dedication uh, of a public holiday, a statutory public holiday, uh, to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who is the uh, first president of Ghana and who was the uh, prime minister at the time of independence, and he represented Accra Central. Dr. Nkrumah later came on to become a great Pan-Africanist in terms of his philosophy of uniting Africa, and he uh, eventually was elected by the BBC at the turn of the century of the 20th century in uh, uh, 2000, 21st century, uh, he was elected by BBC listeners across the world as the African of the century ahead of Nelson Mandela, the famous South African president. Okay, now what I've put here is what I believe is Dr. Nkrumah's most important motion that he filed in Parliament. Uh, I, I was going to talk about the uh, British Parliament as a recommendation for Ghana's uh, new political changes, but we don't have time for that today. We probably will do that on Thursday, uh, even though Thursday will be dedicated a lot to football. Uh, but I've come, I've come uh, to, to bring this today because I feel that this is Dr. Nkrumah's most important motion that he laid before Parliament. Now, when, they, when we talk about the Nkrumah and all of those historical things, because of the obscurity of our history, by our political bosses who decide that we shouldn't study history. A lot of the information is obscured and people don't actually know what happened. Now, this is the motion that Dr. Nkrumah moved for Ghana's independence. And, and people must understand that the Ghana's independence was a motion moved in parliament and it was a motion that was granted. Like today, you go and move a motion in parliament for all sorts of things that parliament do. A motion moved in parliament for e-levy. And the motion was granted by parliament. That's how independence was. It was a motion moved in the Ghanaian parliament uh, to, uh, and sent to the British Parliament that the Ghanaian Parliament had voted for independence, so could you please apply it right now? And then the British Parliament did the same thing. That was the process of independence. It wasn't a guerrilla war that was won by somebody. It wasn't all that. It was this. But because the history had been obscured, a lot of us have not acquainted with it. We're taking the next 15 minutes to sort of show you what Nkrumah said when he moved the motion of destiny. And it's reported in Dr. Nkrumah's autobiography here. Uh, that's the book. It's Nkrumah's autobiography is reported uh, on page 197. Uh, it's entitled The Motion of Destiny. If you get the book, you can see it and read it for yourself. What we've put across on the touch screen is edited versions of it to make the point that we are seeking to make. So permit me now to go to the touch screen and begin. And this is Dr. Nkrumah writing in 1954 when he moved the motion. He said, Mr. Speaker, I began... Uh, it is Nkrumah writing, so he says he began by saying Mr. Speaker. And he continues. He said, I beg to move that this assembly, in adopting the government's white paper on constitutional reform, do authorize the government to request that Her Majesty's government, as soon as the necessary constitutional and administrative arrangements are made for independence, are made, should introduce an act of independence into the United Kingdom Parliament, declaring the Gold Coast a sovereign and independent state within the Commonwealth, and further, that this assembly do authorize the government to ask Her Majesty's government, without prejudice to the above request, to amend as a matter of agency the Gold Coast Constitution Order in Council 1950 in such a way as to provide in Talia that a legislative assembly shall be composed of members directly elected by secret ballot and that all members of the cabinet shall be members of the assembly and directly responsible to it. Mr. Speaker, Nkrumah continued, it is with great humility that I stand before my countrymen and before the representatives of Britain to ask this house to give accent to this motion. In this solemn hour, I am deeply conscious of the grave implications of what we are about to consider. And as the great honor of proposing this motion has fallen to my lot, I pray God to grant me the wisdom, strength and endurance to do my duty as it should be done. We are called upon to exercise statesmanship of a high quality that I would repeat, if I may, my warning of October, every idle or ill-considered word will militate against the cause which we all have at heart. At the outset, he continues, I would like to remind honorable members of a passage in the White Paper that only after the Legislative Assembly debate will the proposals of this government take their final shape and be communicated to the United Kingdom government. Let me pause here and just render an explanation. So what Dr. Nkrumah is doing is that he's moving the motion in, in the Ghanaian parliament in 1954. He's asking members of parliament that it is after the debate that everything that we have said here will be sent to London. He's urging members of parliament that let's consider a certain statesmanship and patriotism as we move this debate. And this is called the motion of independence. So all the theories and philosophy here around that some people were against independence, we will find out today because this is Dr. Nkrumah writing 
This is not Nkrumah's opponents. Rest Nkrumah himself writing. He's detailing what he said to Parliament and asking Parliament to pass the motion. It is upon this motion that Ghana was granted independence. So those who say all of that have to also address the context of what happened after 1954, between 54 and 56, which may have given occasion to the things they talk about. This is the history. It has been obscured. We are publishing it today so that people can see it. Okay, so uh, Nkrumah continues. He says, therefore, let your argument, now he's talking to his colleague members of parliament, minority and majority. He says, let your argument be cogent and constructive. The range of this debate must be national, not regional, patriotic, not partisan. And I now ask that a spirit of cooperation and goodwill pervade this debate. It was Aristotle, the master who knows who said. Now, let me repeat this. Nkrumah was urging the members of parliament. He said, the range of this debate must be national, not regional. Patriotic, not partisan. And now I ask that a spirit of cooperation and goodwill pervade this debate. It was Aristotle who said, now when we finish it, and Nkrumah comes to the end, we will look at the votes. How many votes went in favor of the motion and how many went against. And then you, we will understand whether the parliament had heeded the advice of the prime minister as he urged them here or not. Okay, let's move on. In practical matters, uh, it says, in practical matters, the end is not... Uh, in, in, in practical matters, the end is not, this is his quote in Aristotle. Aristotle said, in practical matters, the end is not mere speculative knowledge of what is to be done, but rather the doing of it. It is not enough to know about the virtue then, but we must endeavor to possess it and to use it. Uh, as with virtue, Nkrumah says, so with self-government. We must endeavor to possess it and to use it. And the motion which I have prepared is the means to possess it. The Prime Minister continues, in seeking your mandate, I'm asking you to give my government the power to bring to fruition the longing hopes, the ardent dreams, the fervent aspirations of the chiefs and people of our country. Throughout a century of alien rule, our people have, with ever-increasing tendency, looked forward to that bright and glorious day when they shall regain their ancient heritage and once more take their place rightly as free men in the world. Mr. Speaker, he continues, we have frequent examples to show that there comes a time in the history of all colonial peoples when they must, because of their will, throw off the hampering shackles of colonialism, boldly assert their God-given rights to be free of a foreign ruler. Today, we are here to claim this right to our independence. Mr. Speaker, he continues, never in the history of the world has an alien ruler granted self-rule to a people on a silver platter. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I say that uh, a people's readiness in the very early days of Christianity, in the, in the very early days of the Christian era, he says, long before England had assumed any importance, long before her people had united into a nation, our ancestors had attained a great empire which lasted until the 11th century, when it fell before the attacks of the Moors and the North. At its height, that empire stretched from Timbuktu to Bamako, and even as far as the Atlantic. It is said that lawyers and scholars were much respected in that empire, and that the inhabitants of Ghana wore garments of wool, cotton, silk, and velvet. There was a trade in copper, gold, and textile fabric, and weapons of gold and silver were carried. Now, this is very important because this is the first time that the name Ghana is mentioned in the whole uh, documentation towards independence. This is Dr. Nkrumah moving the independence motion, knowing that the name Ghana was suggested by the opponents, by the, the UP group. They suggested the name Ghana after Dr. Dankwa's research. Nkrumah is showing here in presenting the motion of destiny to parliament that the name Ghana had been adopted by the government white paper, and he's giving the reasons that Dan Kwai gave him, Buktu, Bamako, and all of that. So this is the motion of independence motion, first moved in 1954. And Dr. Nkrumah is mentioning Ghana, suggesting in the motion that the name Ghana will be the name to be chosen by the Gold Coast people as they, they send the motion to England for approval. Thus, he goes on, we may take pride in the name of Ghana, not out of romanticism, but as an inspiration for the future. It is right and proper that we should know about our past. For just as the future moves from the present, so the present has emerged from the past. Nor need we be ashamed of our past. Now, this one speaks to why history is important. And Kumar was talking about it's important that we know about our past. Some people came and said we should cancel history. Anyway, I move on. There was much in it of glory. 
what our ancestors achieved in the context of their contemporary society gives us confidence that we can create out of that past a glorious future, not in terms of war and military pomp, but in terms of social progress and of peace. We, for we repudiate war and violence. Our battles shall be against the old ideas that keep men trammeled in their own greed, against the crass stupidities that breed hatred, fear, and inhumanity. I like that. Nkrumah said that our, our battles will be against the old ideas that keep men from... I should get that quote. Please get this quote for me so we'll put it on our flyer. He says, our battles shall be against the old ideas that keep men trampled in their own greed against the crass stupidities that breed hatred, fear, and inhumanity. I like that. Put it on our flyer. It is going to permanently be on our flyer. I'll read it again. Our battle shall be against the old ideas that keep men trampled in their own greed, against the crass stupidities that breed hatred, fear, and inhumanity. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on. Nkrumah continues. The heroes of our future will be those who can lead our people out of the stifling fog of disintegration through serfdom into the valley of light where purpose, endeavor, and determination will create that brotherhood which Christ proclaimed 2,000 2, years ago and about which so much is said but so little done. That's very interesting. Dr. Nkrumah is speaking in 1954 like an evangelist of the Pentecost Church. He said here to Parliament, that the heroes of our future will be those who can lead our people out of the stifling fog of disintegration through serfdom into the valley of light where purpose, endeavor, and determination will create that brotherhood which Christ proclaimed 2,000 years ago, about which so much is said, but so little done. The Gold Coast Revolution, and I quote, when the Gold Coast Africans demand self-government today, they are in consequence merely asserting their birthright which they never really surrendered to the British who, disregarding their treaty obligations of 1844, gradually usurped sovereign authority over our country. It goes on. Then the Fante Confederacy, uh, Confederation, the earliest manifestation of Gold Coast nationalism, occurred in 1968 when Fante chiefs attempted to form the Fante Confederacy in order to defend themselves against the might of Ashanti and the incipient political encroachment of British merchants. It was also a union of the, goal of the coastal states for mutual economic and social development. This was declared a dangerous conspiracy with the consequent arrest of his leaders. Then, he's tracing the history of how we came to where we are in 1954. Then, the Aborigines Rights Protection Society was the next nationalist movement to be formed with its excellent aims and objectives. And by putting up their titanic fight for which we cannot be su sufficiently grateful, they formed an unforgettable bastion for the defense of our God-given land and thus preserved our inherent right to freedom. Such men as Mensa Saba, Atta Ahuma, Say, and Wood have played their role in this great fight. Now, this is also a very important part of the conversation because here, Nkrumah really, I mean, what Nkrumah wrote here could have been the memorandum to Parliament on the setting up of the Founders' Day holiday. This thing that Nkrumah wrote could have been easily been the memorandum to Parliament in setting up Founders' Day. But that's why he's talking about those who say that Kwame Nkrumah is the only founder. Kwame Nkrumah himself does not think so. And that's why history is important. It's in the book. He wrote it himself, but they say we shouldn't read it. Now we are reading it. We are finding out that the man that they say he's the founder, he himself, he didn't say that he's founder. He listed the people who had been before him. He did list them in the, the motion that he presented to Parliament. Okay, let's move on. Um, Next came the National Congress of British West Africa. The end of the First Great War brought its strains and stresses and echoes of Allied slogan, We Fight for Freedom, did not pass unheeded in the ears of Casely Hayford, Hatton Mills, and other national stalwarts who were some of the moving spirits of the National Congress for British West Africa. The machinations of imperialism did not take long to smoother the dreams of the people concerned, but today their aims and objectives are being more than gratified with the appointment of African judges and other improvements in our national life. As with the case of the National Congress for British West Africa, the United Gold Coast Convention, the UGCC, 
was organized at the end of the Second World War to give expression to the people's desire for better conditions. The British government, seeing the threats to its security, arrested six members of the convention and detained them for several weeks until the Watson Commission came. The stand taken by the Trace Union Congress, the farmers, the students, and women of the country provides one of the most epic stories in our national struggle. The Kusi Constitution of 1951 further democratized the basis of representation. And now, for the first time in our history, this government is proposing the establishment of a fully elected assembly with ministers directly responsible to it. We have experienced indirect rule. We have had to labor under the yoke of our own disunity caused by the puffed up pride of those who were lucky to enjoy better opportunities in life than their less fortunate brothers. We have experienced the slow and painful progress of constitutional changes by which from councils on which Africans were either absent or merely nominated, this august house was evolved through the exercise by the enfranchised people of their democratic rights to a voice in their own affairs and in so doing, they have shown their confidence in their own countrymen by placing on us the responsibility of our own country's affairs. And so through the years, many have laid to the final rest from the stresses and dangers of the national struggle. And many, like our illustrious friends of the opposition, notwithstanding the fact that we may differ on many points, we have also contributed a share to the totality of our struggle. And we hope that whatever our differences, we shall today become united in the demand for our country's freedom. As I said earlier, this is very important. And Dr. Nkrumah is saying here to the opposition that having been divided, we have all contributed to the struggle. And that today, as he moves this motion, he's expecting that everyone will support it. As I said earlier, what we ask is not for ourselves on this side of the house, which is the CPP, the ruling party, but for all the chiefs and people of this country, the right to live as free men in a committee of nations. We, we are not our ancestors ruling that we're not our ancestors ruling themselves before the white man came to these shores. I have earlier made reference to the ancient history of our more distant forebears in Ghana to assess that certain people are capable of ruling themselves while others are not yet ready, as the saying goes, smacks to me more of imperialism than of reason. Uh, biologists, repute, re, biologists of repute maintain that there is no such thing as a superior race. Men and women are as much products of their environment and geographic climate, ethnic, cultural, social class of instincts, and physical heredity. We are determined to change our environment, and we shall advance in like manner. According to the motto of the valiant Accra Evening News, that's his newspaper, he said, the motto again, we prefer self-government with danger to severity and tranquility. Honorable members, Osajifo continues, you are called here now as a result of relentless tide of history by nemesis, as it were, to a sacred charge for you hold the destiny of our country in your hands. The eyes and ears of the world are upon you. Yea, our oppressed brothers throughout this vast continent of Africa and the new world are looking to you with desperate hope as an inspiration to continue their grim fight against cruelties which we in this corner of Africa have never known cruelties which are a disgrace to humanity and to the civilization uh, which the white man has set himself to teach us. At this time, history is being made. A colonial people in Africa has put forward the first definite claim for independence. An African colonial people proclaimed that they are ready to assume the stature of free men and to prove to the world uh, that they are worthy of trust. Uh, Nkrumah says, I know you will not fail uh, to choose who, uh, blah, 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 etc. It's not clear. Let me move on. Okay. Um, she, here he talks about Queen Elizabeth. So let's do that. He says, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has just been crowned barely one month ago. The memory is still fresh in our minds. The Queen herself has not forgotten the emotions called forth as she first felt the weight of the crown upon her head. The decorations in London streets are hardly down. The millions of words written about the coronation and its meaning will endure for centuries. The prayers from millions of lips are still fresh. The vows of dedication to duty, which the queen made, are a symbol of the duties devolving on the commonwealth. And so, we, rep we repudiate the evil doctrines 
which we know are promulgated and accepted elsewhere as truth. To Britain, this is the supreme testing moment in her African relations. When we turn our eyes uh, to the sorry events in South, Central, and East Africa, when we hear the dismal news about Kenya and Central African federations, we are cheered by the more cordial relations that exist between us and Britain. We are now asking her to allow that relationship to ripen into golden bonds of freedom, equality, and fraternity by complying without delay to our request for self-government. We are sure that the British government will demonstrate its goodwill towards the people of the Gold Coast by granting us self-government, which we now so earnestly desire. We enjoin the people of Britain and all political parties to give our request their ardent support. Mr. Speaker, for my part, I can only re-echo the words of a great man. Man's dearest possession is life. And since it is given to him to live but once, he must so live as not to be smeared with the shame of a cowardly existence and a trivial past. So live that dying, he might say, all my life and all my strength were given to the finest cause in the world, the liberation of mankind. Mr. Speaker, Nkrumah says, now God be thanked who has matched us with this hour, I beg to move. That was the independence motion moved by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah to the Parliament of Ghana. This was the independence motion. Notice last word, said, Mr. Speaker, now God be thanked who has matched us with this hour. He moved the motion. So then, what happened when the motion was moved to the Parliament of the uh, United Party, the UP group, uh, the NLM group, and the CPP? So, I beg to move is the last thing he told Parliament. The rest is his own commentary. He says, the acclamation, the acclamation that best forth was such that one expected the roof and the walls to collapse. As soon as the cheering was heard by those waiting outside, they took it up as well. That's what happened. People went to the parliament house. And Nkrumah is writing. He was speaking from inside parliament and even speaking from the box. He said the acclamation that met the completion of his motion, when he said, I beg to move, that acclamation could have ripped off the roof of the parliament house and all the walls could have broken because it was so loud. Now, let's see what happened after that. He said those outside, when they heard the cheering inside, also began cheering because they thought the independent motion had passed and that Ghana was going to be independent. Let's see what uh, Nkrumah says after that. He said, members from both sides of the house came to congratulate me and in the words of the official legislative assembly debate. Okay, so I, I'll pause here. Let me come back, come, bring me back on the screen. It's very important. So the motion of independence was moved by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, 1954. This is it. It's produced in his book. I've produced some of it, the essential part. He finished moving the motion and told Mr. Speaker that I've moved it. I beg to move. And he said the acclamation was huge. He said he was congratulated by both sides of the house. Professor Buzia was in the house on that day. He led the minority. Uh, uh, Mumuni Baumia was in the house that day. He was sitting there on the CPP side. Uh, uh, others were there. Joe Apia and others. Victor Usu. They were all in the house. And Nkrumah said, when I moved the motion, the both sides came to congratulate. But we've heard people saying independence was opposed by some people. They said that's not correct. And they say that because they changed the context. This is the independence motion moved by Kwame Nkrumah, 1954. This is the record. And thankfully, we had a president who writes. So this is Nkrumah himself writing. It's not, it's not Dr. Dankwa writes. It's Nkrumah writing. Okay, so let's see what he says. He says, according to the Legislative Assembly debate, the document in the House, the House was suspended for 15 minutes. J.A. Brimer, Minister for Communication and Works, then seconded the motion. And after it had been debated upon for a few days, it was carried unanimously. You see, book doesn't lie. Black and white doesn't lie. We've heard it all the time. They've been telling us, oh, they say that the people said they don't want independence was opposed. This is the record. The independence motion was carried unanimously. By, and we, can, we have the list of all the members in the House in 1954. We have the list. It says in the hands that. The independence motion was carried unanimously. So they should come back and explain to us what happened. Maybe from next week, we'll get back into 55, 56 and see what happened. But this is the independence motion that was moved to Forgana's independence. Osaitifu said it was carried unanimously. He said, 
With this amended constitution, the anomalies in the Kusi constitution were more or less eradicated. But in order to give effect to this, it was necessary to call a general election. Okay, so he said a general election was called to give effect to the constitutional amendment. But the motion, independence motion was carried. Well, I'd like to leave it here. And then let's, let's, look, at, um, let's look at a comparative, a small comparative matter. <laughs>